Good afternoon, morning or evening. Blessed Lent. My name is Teva Regal, and I am the current president of the Orthodox Theological Society in America, or OTSA. On behalf of the Officers of the Society, I would like to welcome you to this online seminar, Anti-Judaism and Orthodox Hymnography, beginning a conversation before Holy Week. For those of you who may not be familiar with OTSA, the Orthodox Theological Society in America was organized in 1966 under the auspices and with the blessing of the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops in the Americas, or what was known as SCOBA. It is now an affiliated professional organization of the Assembly of Bishops. The society exists in order to promote the study and development of Orthodox theology, coordinate the work of Orthodox theologians in North America, bringing Orthodox scholars from all jurisdictions together for dialogue and to promote the collaboration of Orthodox churches in North America. Cultivate scholarship, fellowship, spiritual life, and cooperation in honest, open, and collegial discourse among those engaged in advanced study, teaching, research, and writing in a range of theological subjects and related disciplines. Serve as a resource for the Assembly of Bishops and the Church and engage non-Orthodox theologians interested in Orthodox theology. It is with these purposes in mind that we are sponsoring our seminar today. The issue of anti-Jewish texts within the Byzantine Rite is longstanding and complex. The Orthodox Theological Society in America is establishing a working group of liturgical scholars and specialists in Jewish-Christian theological dialogue to study and make recommendations for liturgical renewal within the Orthodox Church. To launch this endeavor, and in advance of this year's Holy Week, a time when many of these anti-Jewish hymns are most prominent, our panelists will introduce some of the main issues involved and suggest some practical advice that can be implemented in the local parish usage. Before I introduce the chair of this event, I would like to review some of the format and logistics of this online seminar. Our program will begin with remarks from the chair for this event, Father Jeffrey Reddy. This will be followed by remarks from each of the panelists, our first presentation at approximately 20 minutes and with subsequent presentations around 10 or 15 minutes each. After each presentation, we will pause so that you may ask clarifying questions of the respective presenter. Use the chat function to submit your written questions or quote unquote, raise your hand in the reactions button to submit your question. I will then unmute you so that you may speak to the group. We ask that you pose any questions in a respectful manner. After the presentations, we will open the floor for further questions and discussion. This is a Zoom meeting, which means that we can see one another. We hope that this will facilitate a robust dialogue However, if you do not wish to be seen, you can turn off your camera. I will be spotlighting the speakers during their respective presentations. In case of technical difficulties on this end, I suggest that you set your screen for speaker view in order to focus on the particular presentation. You can do so by toggling the setting in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. We also have opened the chat for out-of-band dialogue. Note, this seminar is being recorded. Once edited, we plan to post it on our website. Now I would like to introduce the chair for our event, Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Reddy, who will offer our opening prayer and then introduce and moderate our panel. Father Jeffrey is the Director of Orthodox Christian Studies at Trinity College, University of Toronto, where he teaches liturgical theology, pastoral studies, and both Old and New Testament. His research interests include the narrative of God and Israel in Orthodox liturgy, Second Temple Judaism and, Jude and Jewish Christian origins, the parting of the ways, and Orthodox Christian theological dialogue with Judaism today. Father Jeffrey. Thank you, Teva. I would like us to begin with a word of prayer. So let us pray. O oh God, who didst choose Israel to be thine inheritance, have mercy upon us and forgive us for violence and wickedness against our brother Jacob. The arrogance of our hearts and minds has deceived us and shame has covered our face. Take away all pride and prejudice in us 
and grant that we, together with the people whom thou didst first make thine own, may attain to the fullness of redemption which thou hast promised, to the honor and glory of thy most holy name. Amen. This prayer was drafted a few years ago by Anglicans here in Canada to replace the traditional Western Good Friday prayer for the conversion of the Jews. This new prayer was created in consultation with Jewish rabbis and leaders and expresses something of the rekindled dialogue relationship and common purpose between Christians and Jews today. Let me add to Teva's words a warm welcome to everyone this afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking this seriously. I'm going to make some preliminary remarks in the course of which I will introduce the three other panelists and what they will be speaking about. After these initial presentations, we will open up a conversation amongst our panelists and with you all, so there'll be an opportunity to make comments or raise questions or otherwise further the conversation. Allow me to start, though, with a lament, with a series of laments. I lament in the first instance that an old kind of hate that we thought we had moved past has become very visible again. High-profile entertainers and athletes have openly spouted anti-Semitic tropes. The former president dined with an outspoken Holocaust denier. Beyond these headlines, there's been a steady rise in the number of hateful incidents directed at Jewish people. According to the Anti-Defamation League, the last couple of years have been the highest years on record for documented reports of harassment, vandalism, and violence directed against Jews. Here in Toronto, as elsewhere in North America, synagogues, shuls, and temples have to employ private security firms to protect their premises and people from violence. Whilst this is not Europe in the 1930s, and significant social and religious leaders are indeed standing up and calling out these problems, I lament that ordinary Christians and all too many Orthodox Christians among them not only do not take the rise of anti-Semitism seriously, but also tacitly allow it to fester. We tend to think of the headline incidents, which all people of reasonably goodwill condemn, but there is a low-grade but sinister anti-Semitism that pervades our culture, and it's reinforced every time we casually receive and repeat false stereotypes, including in our sermons, in our catechesis, in our hymns, in our conversations. Even the best teachers and homilists resort unthinkingly to such tropes, Jews as legalists or hypocrites, as fleshly rather than spiritually minded, or as wealthy and powerful. You don't have to go far or listen hard to hear these stereotypes. A bunch of them have been featured together in a blog post posted recently to the OCA website and highlighted prominently on its homepage. In addition, words like pharisaical are used thoughtlessly in our prayers and sermons, and as it turns out, entirely inaccurately. It's just not what a Pharisee is or means. I recommend everyone get a copy of the book, The Pharisees, edited by Father Joseph Sievers and Dr. Amy Jo Levine, published just over a year ago. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest from a range of scholars who provide multidisciplinary appraisal of the Pharisees, who they were, what they taught, how they've been understood or depicted throughout history. Then go and help dispel the negative stereotypes of Pharisees that have buttressed anti-Semitic prejudices. If we are not actively engaged in rooting out these stereotypes and correcting them, then we are part of the problem. As we have learned with other forms of racism, we need to be actively anti-racist or else we are participating in and perpetuating evil and hatred. I lament that not only have we misunderstood and misrepresented Jews and Judaism for centuries, but we have not taken stock of all the new learning and insights into both Christian and Jewish origins in the last few decades. Scholarship that, as anyone in religious studies will know, situates Jesus and Paul not as Christians opposing or breaking with Judaism, but as faithfully working within Judaism, as Torah-observant Jews reflecting and teaching out of the very heart of Jewish tradition, neither coming to, a, neither coming to oppose Jewish faith and practice, but picking up and reiterating the key themes of love, grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation that are embedded at the very heart of the Torah and prophets. Whether we're talking about Jesus or Paul within Judaism, or the first century origins of both rabbinic Judaism and the Jewish sect that would come eventually to be called Christianity, or the new understanding of the parting of the ways between them as a complex and arguably never definitive process that lasted many centuries, 
I lament that this knowledge and wisdom have hardly touched our Orthodox seminaries and theological schools and classrooms, let alone our parish communities and conversations. Sometimes there are courses. I myself teach a course called Salvation is from the Jews, Christianity and Judaism in Theological Perspective and Dialogue. But these should not be the sideline elective courses that they often are. This content should rather be at the heart of every course on the scriptures, on church history, on liturgy, on Christology, on ecclesiology, indeed on pastoral studies and mission. I started these remarks with a prayer borrowed from Anglicans. That is itself telling. There are no orthodox equivalents. I lament that despite what we often claim to hold as untold depths of orthodox theological tradition and a method of doing theology that's capable of nuance and mystery, not to mention soaring to poetic heights, despite this, I lament that we are laggards, we are theological layabouts. On the 28th of October, 1965, the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed the statement, Nostra Etate, in our time. Among the landmark statements in that document, we find the proclamation, as the sacred synod searches into the mystery of the church, it remembers the bond that spiritually ties the people of the new covenant to Abraham's stock. Search within the mystery of the church, the fathers of the council said, and you will find Israel. You find our Jewish sisters and brothers. From this statement, we now have five and a half decades of theological reflection amongst Catholic and other Western Christians retrieving and renewing understandings of the Messiah and Ecclesia as fundamentally intertwined with Israel, with covenant, and with Torah. And where are we in this? Of course, Orthodox Christianity remains in so many ways closest of all Christian traditions to our Jewish roots, liturgically, culturally, theologically. We preserve so much of the period from which both rabbinic Judaism and the Judaism that came to be called Christianity emerged. We sing the songs of Israel and commemorate her saints. Yet we have no significant theology after the Shoah. We have gained little from recent scholarship and insights into Second Temple Judaism and Christian origins. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule, and I'm delighted that we're joined today by the Reverend Dr. Michael Azar, who has been diligently working, researching, and teaching on both ancient and modern Christian-Jewish relations. We will be hearing shortly from him and his experience in this area. I lament, too, that although Holy Week is nearly upon us, and it's the focus of our conversation today, that it's not just about Holy Week. We sing and pray some truly appalling things during Holy Week, but we also have a Sunday dedicated precisely to prom promulgating every stereotype about Pharisees we could possibly imagine. Of course, it's ostensibly about the parable from the Gospel of Luke, but we give it a rather narrow reading, and only occasionally do some of the hymns hint at a more expansive interpretation highlighting the interdependence and need for one another of the tax collector and Pharisee. We have a feast dedicated to congratulating ourselves on the superiority of a spiritual reading of the scriptures over against a fleshly Jewish one. Poised halfway between Pascha and Pentecost, in the feast of mid-Pentecost, over and over again we sing things like, since you do not understand the scriptures, you are all deceived, O you lawless Hebrews. In other words, you see the fleshly, the literal, the superficial, and apparent, whereas we see spiritually and truly and deeply. So throughout the church year, we have all these texts and teachings that perpetuate stereotypes like grace versus law, spiritual versus fleshly, truth versus hypocrisy, all in relation to our Jewish siblings. Yet at least most of these are overt. Potentially far worse is the myriad of ways that our teaching and preaching and casual conversation perpetuates false histories and ideas and stereotypes about Jews and Christians. We have become tone deaf and we don't even hear these most of the time. I lament that we too easily make excuses for all this. We're just repeating and retelling the gospel story, we say, forgetting that it matters tremendously how that story is told. Moreover, we forget that we've taken up the story of people who were themselves Jews, the story of Jesus and his first followers, and we can only do that faithfully if we remain close to them. When we part ways with Jews, when we other them, and when we define ourselves in opposition to them, when we appropriate every last weapon of Hellenistic rhetoric against them, then we are no longer capacitated to live or tell that story, 
and certainly not to use the intra-Jewish language and rhetoric they used as they sought to proclaim the message of the inbreaking kingdom of God and his Messiah. The way we tell the story in many of the hymns is not even the original way that story was told, and it even undermines core early Christian theology. This is what Dr. George Dimakopoulos will be presenting in a few moments as he reprises the talk he gave to the Otsa Conference in Volos, Greece in January. We also say that no one really hears or understands these words anyway. There's of course some truth to the fact that this matter has become more pressing in translation as words in liturgical Greek or church Slavonic can often pass worshipers by. But it's not true that the words are of no effect as they do shape and inform preaching and teaching and understanding. As Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory noted, there was always a rise in pogroms around Holy Week and Pascha. These words have been and remain truly hurtful to Jews. Svetlana Panic is also one of our panelists today. She will speak as a Jewish Christian, joining to her voice those of other Jewish Christians, both clergy and lay, who experience firsthand the full force of our hate speech. As we will hear from her, though, Svetlana is not without hope. She is joyful and infectiously optimistic. So enough of the laments, or rather, I want to turn my final lament into a hope. When we set out to tackle things as we're doing today, the greatest fear is always that we are somehow at risk of compromising truth. Not a few of our Orthodox brothers and sisters, okay, probably mostly brothers, will be condemning us for merely suggesting this kind of conversation needs to take place. They would say that reforming liturgical texts as we are proposing and even needing to contextualize the New Testament in better ways amount to watering down the truth of the gospel as an exercise in political correctness, the triumph of social niceties over eternal truth. As Jesus is the savior of the whole world, the argument goes, it is necessary to condemn those who haven't received him as such, including or maybe even especially the Jewish people. If we have the truth, there can be no ongoing reality of God's covenant relationship with genealogical Israel. Yet, as you all know, as Orthodox Christians, we prize at the heart of our faith truths that hold contradictions in tension. The truest things are antinomies and ultimately ineffable mysteries. Is God three or one? Yes. Is Jesus God or man? Yes. So is Jesus the universal savior of the world, the one through whom God is reconciling all things to himself? Or are God's promises to Israel indeed irrevocable, as St. Paul says, and so Jews continue to live faithfully within God's covenant family? To this either-or proposition, I think we can and should finally and clearly proclaim yes. This was the answer by that famous monk of the Eastern Church, Father Lev Gillet, in his prophetic book, Communion in the Messiah, published in the early 1940s. In it, he writes, the whole message of Israel is an authentic part of God's revelation and can be, without the abolition of a single jot, brought together with the message of Jesus. Nothing of the true Jewish tradition, from Hillel to modern Hasidism, needs to be altered in order to adjust itself to the gospel. It needs only to be complemented. That's a very orthodox approach indeed, from one whose example we would do well to follow. And so ends my opening diatribe. Now to Dr. George Dimakopoulos. George is Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies at Fordham University. He's the co-founding director of the Ortho Orthodox Christian Studies Center and co-founding editor of the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies. His presentation on the anti-Jewish rhetoric in the Good Friday hymns at the recent Otsa conference in Volos, Greece, which he will now present again, was the catalyst for the establishment of the new working group on anti-Jewish hymns in the Orthodox liturgy, for which this event serves as a kind of launch. Over to you, Jork. Uh, thank you, Father Jeffrey. Um, that, that was really a, a, a beautiful introduction. Uh, thank you to Teva and all of the other officers, um, to Paul Laudersur, who was with us in Greece, who recommended that we that we do this. Um, just uh, really a couple quick points of introduction before I get started. I, I am not someone who has historically worked on Jewish Christian um, questions, um, nor am I really a, a scholar of liturgy. Um, I have been um, in the process of writing a book 
on uh, early, early Christian hymns and um, how, how they treat violence. And so what you're going to hear from me today is really a kind of anecdote um, that I discovered uh, in the process of doing the research for that book. Um, a, a fuller version of this will appear um, in, in the book when it's published. Um, I've just received back the peer review and need to make some revisions. Um, but um, it, 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 anyway, it's, it's something that uh, sort of shocked me when I was able to kind of triangulate uh, a few different pieces that, that scholars all knew about, but it, I, I suppose never really put, put together because they were just working in different silos. And I just happened to be the one that kind of read it all and pull, pull, pulled it all together. So I, I should also mention that Oza was actually not the not the first time that I spoke about this a little bit in public. I also did so uh, at Hellenic, Hellenic College Holy Cross last year for the anniversary of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Um, so that was the first time I did this. So I've been I've been working on this a, a little bit in public as I've been revising the manuscript. Okay, so that's the end of it. The the title of my paper is called Anti-Jewish Rhetoric in the Good Friday Hymns. Okay. The oldest surviving Christian hymns designed exclusively for Holy Week are a set known as the Idiomele. They were composed by monks in Palestine during the reign of the Roman Emperor Justinian. In the modern Orthodox Church, these 12 hymns are sung during the royal hour service of Good Friday morning. The final and most famous of these hymns is sung during two additional services. Uh, in the Greek tradition, we do this on Holy Thursday evening and the Apokad. Apo, Apo, Talipsi service, I never pronounced that correctly, of Friday afternoon. Apart from their antiquity, the most noteworthy feature of these 12 hymns is that they were the first to blame the Jews for the death of Christ. So my goals in this uh, address are fourfold. First, I will demonstrate that the presentation of the Jews in these hymns constituted a dramatic change from earlier hymns that reflected on the crucifixion of Christ. Second, I will argue that this change represents more than a mere rhetorical or apologetical shift, but constitutes a profound theological change. Third, I will demonstrate that this change was precipitated by an explosion of Jewish Christian violence at the time of composition and that these hymns likely reflect a form of anti-Jewish revenge literature. Finally, I will suggest that the idiomile have been unwittingly preserved down to the present day by a series of individuals and institutions that presumably knew nothing of their origins of composition and who have been either incapable or unwilling to, in, to address their theological incoherence. So part one, a reversal of previous hymno hymnography. The Idiomele may not be, may be the oldest Holy Week hymns, but they are not the first hymns to reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Approximately 1,000 hymns emphasizing those very themes predate the Idiomele by about 100 years at a minimum. Those earlier hymns also originate from Palestine, specifically the Church of the Anastasi, and they were part of an eight-week cycle of hymns for the Vesper Orthros liturgy services of Sundays, the oldest form of an octoikos, the eight-week cycle. These hymns were composed in Greek, but they survive only in ancient Georgian translation, contained within a text known as the Jerusalem Georgian Chant Book. The hymns of the Chant Book are the oldest Christian hymns in existence, uh, apart from what's in the New Testament, and they provide an unparalleled insight to, uh, theological, to the theological vision of the earliest Christian communities. While a few of the hymns in the chant book do contain negative statements about the Jews, none of them suggest that the Jews alone were responsible for the death of Christ. On the contrary, they consistently position the whole of humanity as responsible for the death of Christ. 
precisely because Christ's death and resurrection save the whole of humanity from death. In other words, our earliest evidence of Christian liturgy informs us that week after week, Christians sang of themselves as the ones responsible for the death of Christ. All of this began to change with the composition of the Idiomali. Four of the 12 hymns explicitly name the Jews as the lone group responsible for Jesus's crucifixion. These are the fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth hymns, respectively. A fifth speaks indirectly of the Jews by juxtaposing the transgressors, paranomi, to the Gentiles. In this particular hymn, the Gentiles are alighted with the singers, in other words, the Christians, because they are the only ones who glorify Christ with the Father and Spirit. Thus, nearly half of the idiomali develop their exegetical theological points about the crucifixion by blaming the Jews for Jesus's violent death. For example, in the sixth hymn, Christ rhetorically asks the Jews which of the many miraculous things that he did for them was the cause of his crucifixion. The list of miracles not only serves to reinforce the Christian belief in Jesus's divinity, but it also calls attention to the failure of the Jews to acknowledge Christ's effort on their behalf. The explicit naming of the Jews suggests that culpability for Christ's suffering belongs exclusively to them. The implicit we of the octoikos has been replaced by the accusation that it is the Jews alone who have put Christ to death. In effect, the point of reflection has changed. Rather than see the crucifixion as an ontological event that alters the relationship between God and humanity, five of the idiomali turn the crucifixion into a narrowly focused historical narrative in which Christ is murdered by a specific group of outsiders whose descendants remain culpable for his death. By speaking of the Jews and the Jews alone as transgressors responsible for Christ's death, the authors of these hymns erase key historical aspects of the gospel account of Christ's passion. Indeed, it is noteworthy that this set of hymn makes no mention of the role of the Romans in the crucifixion, even though crucifixion was a Roman form of punishment. The hymns offer no reference to Pilate or his wife or the Roman soldiers who put Christ to death. Is this because Christian identity among Palestinian Christians has evolved to such a great degree that the authors of the Idiomali now so fully view themselves as Romans that they deliberately ignore Roman culpability in the violence that Christ suffers? Perhaps more importantly, we might ask why the authors of the Idiomali speak of the Jews as though they are some foreign external community when, in fact, Jesus, his disciples, and the vast majority of his early followers are not only Jews by birth, but by observance. In short, these hymns transform the assignment of guilt for Christ's death from the we to a they, the Jews. Okay, part two, theological problems. To understand the theological significance of recalibrating who is responsible for the violence that Christ suffers, we can look to a comparison between those idiomali that do and those that do not isolate the Jews for censure. The second hymn affirms that Christ was nailed to the cross by wicked men for our sins. The third notes that Christ suffered the, suffered the transgressors to lay hold of him. Hymns that use phrases like wicked men or transgressors to identify the culprits of Christ's crucifixion without any other indication of their identity are both more historically accurate and more amenable to a constructive exegesis of the crucifixion than those that transfer all of the guilt to an external body, such as the Jews. This is because a singer 
can see themselves in the more generic descriptions of sinners. As the ancient Sunday hymns affirm, Christ suffered on behalf of all because all humans have sinned and need the saving act of Christ's death and resurrection. But in shifting the focus of culpability for Christ's death from a collective group of singing sinners to a non-singing external community, the Jews, these five hymns forsake one of the most important theological dimensions of the Christian theology of the cross, that Christ died because we needed him to do so. To be clear, not all of the idiomali make this theological mistake, and poetically, many of them are beautiful. The final one, which begins, today is hung upon the cross, he who sp suspended the earth and the waters, is to my mind the most powerful hymn of Holy Week. But there is little doubt that the five anti-Jewish hymns introduce a new and theologically problematic account of the crucifixion. Why, we might ask, did the authors of the Idiomali abandon centuries of hymnographic tradition to assign blame for Christ's death outside of the community? So part three, historical answers. When we attempt to answer this question, we should not lose sight of the fact that Palestine possessed a sizable Jewish community even after the legalization of Christianity. Indeed, at the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine's accession, the Jewish community was both larger and stronger than that of the Christians in Palestine. Like other parts of the empire, Palestine did not become majority Christian until the early part of the 5th century. But even then, the number of Jews and Samaritans in Palestine remained significant. The continued presence of so many Jews in Palestine may have posed something of an existential threat to Christians there. Legally and financially speaking, the situation for Jews deteriorated considerably after Constantine's legalization of Christianity. Since antiquity, the Romans had placed certain restrictions on Jews, but they had exempted them from imperial requirements for religious conformity. Constantine maintained this status quo, but his successors enacted new laws that introduced strict boundaries between Christian and Jewish communities. In response to their declining status, some Jews and Samaritans undertook periods of armed resistance against the Romans in Palestine between the mid-4th and mid-5th century. It is noteworthy that those initial uprisings were followed by nearly a century of peace between the Council of Chalcedon and 451 and the beginning of the reign of the Emperor Justinian in 527. This period is noteworthy, this period of relative peace, because it coincides with the likely dating of the production of the Octoikos, which shows far fewer signs of anti-Jewish rhetoric than the Idiomali. But this relative peace between Christians and Jews in Palestine came to an abrupt end with Justinian. The emperor imposed vigorous anti-Jewish legislation that, among other things, recalibrated the legal definition of heresy to include anyone who was not orthodox. This meant that the punishments for doctrinal nonconformity could now be applied to non-Christians. For, for example, Justinian was the first emperor to prohibit Jews from serving as members of local town councils, which dramatically diminished their civic and financial opportunities for Jewish landowners. The emperor also expanded the penalties for Jews owning slaves and passed a new law that required Jews to release any slave who sought baptism, regardless of whether the motivation for conversion was genuine. Whereas those laws had placed financial hardships on Jewish communities, Justinian's Novella 37 and Novella 131 imposed religious restrictions 
by forbidding the construction of new synagogues. The effort to frustrate Jewish worship went even further in the Palestinian town of Borion, where Justinian ordered the transformation of a local synagogue into a church and likely forced many of the Jews to convert to Christianity by um, forced conversion through the army. Given the amplification of anti-Jewish measures, it is not surprising that Justinian's reign witnessed the largest outbreak of anti-Christian violence led by Jews in the entire late ancient period. The most dramatic of these uprisings occurred in the early 550s. In this particular instance, a mob of Jews and Samaritans joined forces to assault the Christians of Caesarea, the coastal city and capital of the Roman provincial government. In addition to killing a number of Christians, including the provincial governor, the mob plundered and burned several Christian churches. Additional uprisings followed, which consistently pitted Palestinian Christians and Jews against one another well into the seventh century. In his redating of these 12 hymns, Christopher Sweeney compellingly argued that the hymns were produced sometime between Justinian's first edict on the Theopascite controversy, which occurred in the year 533, and the transformation of the liturgical calendar in Jerusalem, which occurred in the year 560. According to Sweeney, the hymns were either composed by Meophysite monks in Gaza between 533 and 553, and adopted by the Chalcedonian monks of Marsaba after Justinian's pro-Theopascite legislation of 553, or the hymns were produced by the monks of Marsaba in the very narrow time frame between 553 and 560. Either scenario lends itself to a Chalcedonian adoption of these hymns at precisely the point in history and precisely in the place in history where Jewish and Christian communities were undergoing unprecedented levels of conflict, and either scenario reflects the precise moment when imperial legislation and rhetoric took its harshest anti-Jewish turn. In other words, the amplification of anti-Jewish rhetoric contained within the idiomily is fully consistent with the on-the-ground realities of Jewish-Christian conflict at the time of their composition. In short, the ahistorical, anti-Jewish dimension of these hymns reflects a kind of revenge literature. Part four, the perpetuation of anti-Jewish rhetoric in Holy Week hymns. It would be impossible to produce a complete history of the transmission of manuscripts from the original composition of the Idiomali in Palestine in the 550s to the printing of Ottoman era texts that serve as the basis for modern Orthodox Holy Week service in a variety of languages. Nevertheless, I will attempt a very brief overview that explains the major changes to the Holy Week commemoration between the composition in, of these 12 hymns in the 550s to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese printing of the English language translation of the Holy Week book by Father George Papadeus in 1963. It is generally well known that Jerusalem and Constantinople served as the two greatest incubators for hymnographic composition for the Greek-speaking Orthodox world during the Byzantine era. In the centuries after the initial composition of the Idiomali, um, Palestinian authors continued to compose new hymns for the commemoration of Christ's passion and resurrection. That composition underwent a profound change during the late seventh and early eighth century with the introduction of a new genre known as the canon. During the ninth century, the famous Constantinopolitan monastery of Studios imported and rearranged hundreds, if not thousands of hymns that had been in use in Palestine. 
The Studite monks created the first distinctive tipicon for the Triodion period using a combination of Jerusalem hymns, pre-existing Constantinopolitan hymns, and hymns of Studite composition. As you all know, the Triodion concludes with the services of Holy Week. Between the 9th and 15th centuries, the monks of Studios continued to experiment with the composition of new hymns and the rearrangement of existing hymns in their Triodion. For example, it wasn't until the very end of this period that we find the first manuscripts that include some of the encopia or lamentations that we sing on uh, Holy Friday evening. We should bear in mind that the Studite Tipicon for services was just one among many. Most cathedral churches, whether in Constantinople or Akrid or Jerusalem, had their own Tipicon, just as every major monastic house had its own Tipicon. We privileged the Studite one in our histories of liturgy because it was the first to introduce a triodion and because it came to have an outsized influence on our modern services. In part, this is because the Latin occupation of Byzantium during the Fourth Crusade put a permanent end to the cathedral rite of Hagia Sophia, catapulting the monastic typicon of studios into prominence. But mostly, it is because the first Ottoman era printings of liturgical texts were printings of services that were derivative of the Studite Tipicon, even though the Studite Monastery no longer existed at the time of those printings. We should not lose sight of the extraordinary power of the printing press to codify a particular liturgical form, effectively suppressing all the others. Indeed, the current form of our Holy Week services including the specific hymns that we sing, were Ottoman-era arrangements of a Studite-inspired version of the Triodion, which happened to be the one mass-produced in Greek via print houses in Italy during the Ottoman period. The Papadeus translation that the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese typically uses was borrowed from an anonymous 1915 English translation of the Greek Triodion, then in use at the Fenar. Returning to my theme of anti-Jewish rhetoric in the Idiomali, I'll observe that in the 1100 years between their composition and the last hymns to be composed for our Holy Week services, which occurred during the Ottoman period, Changing historical circumstances gave rise to new hymnographic forms and theological reflections. But one thing that did not change was the penchant for Byzantine and Ottoman hymnographers to perpetuate and even expand anti-Jewish rhetoric in their accounts of Christ's passion. To my mind, this is deeply problematic not only because these hymns break from the theological tradition of the earliest church, the first 450 years, but because they can so easily be shown to be an ahistorical rhetorical reaction to temporary conditions that no longer exist. It may well be the case that the Middle Byzantine monks who incorporated the offending idiomali into the triodion and crafted new hymns inspired by them knew nothing of the historic origins and simply presumed that they were theologically sound because they had been employed by a previous generation. The same is true of the Ottoman era Orthodox who printed the texts and the 20th century translators of those texts. But we do not have the luxury of that same ignorance. Is it not time for us to expunge hymns from our Good Friday commemorations when those hymns fail to capture the theological significance of the event we are actually commemorating?
Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Um, as Teva indicated at the beginning, we'll just have a moment or two if there's anybody who has a clarifying question at this point, just anything that wasn't clear uh, or understandable in that presentation. We'll take those questions now, but otherwise the content and substance of that can come up in the general conversation to follow. I see there's a question in the chat. Which author did George cite regarding the attribution of the Idiomela to Palestinian monks of the fifth century? Was that Sweeney? Um, yeah, Christopher Sweeney. He was a um, doctoral student at Fordham who wrote a dissertation on the treatment of grief. Um, and uh, it, it's precisely because these Holy Week hymns um, and, and those that come right after them are the first to think of grief in a positive way. And so that's why he got invested in it. I, I also see in the chat, somebody is asking, what does Theopaskite mean? It has to do with the theological question of, um, does God suffer on the cross or is it just the humanity of Jesus that suffers on the cross? And this was a very big debate in the, in the context of the sixth century. And it was the... Um, the Emperor Justinian basically adopted uh, a theological position uh, that, yes, God does su suffer on the cross, and this became the imperial position. Um, and so it was – so we know we, – we know – and these hymns convey that theology. These 12 hymns convey that theology, and their use by Chalcedonian monks um, could have only come after – Justinian's edict. So that's why we're able to date them um, to this decade. Very good. Thank you. Okay. I would now like to call upon the Reverend Dr. Michael Azar. Father Deacon Michael is Associate Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Scranton. His current book project, tentatively titled Orthodox Christianity and the Reframing of Jewish-Christian Relations, focuses on ancient and modern Christian-Jewish interaction, particularly in light of Orthodox Christian hermeneutics and historic presence in the Holy Land. His other scholarly pursuits focus on New Testament studies, especially apocalyptic thought and the parting of the ways, as well as the effects that contemporary socio-political policies have on scholarly understandings of the ancient world. Father Michael, I stress, will not be responding to George's talk as such, but rather speaking from his years of experience in these areas of study and engagement. Father Michael. Uh, thank you, Father Jeffrey, and thank you, George. Um, yeah, to, uh, to, to second what, what uh, Father Jeffrey just said, I will not be responding to, to George. Uh, and from previous interactions, I think George knows some of the comments I would have um, on, some, on some earlier drafts of, of, of which I, I read previously. So um, all I'm doing for the next few minutes, really, is I, I just want to, uh, since my article on the Holy Week hymns was sent out as part of the initial reading in the registration for this, uh, I was asked maybe to just summarize a few key points and maybe add a few new things for those that perhaps have not been able uh, to take a look at it. And here I take a different perspective um, than George, where George's account was more diachronic, looking at the or historical origins of hymns. I'm taking a more historical, I mean, a more uh, synchronic uh, look and looking at the current composition as they stand and as they are practiced in at least a significant number of churches. Uh, of course, the disclaimer here, as all Orthodox know well, is that not, you know, no one church really celebrates in the exact same way. And some of the um, more egregious parts that, for example, George mentioned aren't even sung in some dioceses, uh, since a lot of them occur in the holy, the royal hours on Friday morning, which are just not done in some places. Um, so <clears throat> to summarize what I've done, what I've, what the, the route that I'm taking, um, Looking at the more synchronic aspect of the of the Holy Week hymns, I just kind of want to emphasize or rate, bring to the question of the theological emphases of the hymns as they currently stand in order to consider what might change if the hymns were amended or adjusted in any particular way. Uh, giving And I'd like to give sort of the theological or uh, rhetorical origins, if you will, or emphases of the hymns themselves. So what we celebrate, you know, in two weeks is very much Passover, and in some ways an un unremarkable continuation of Passover as known, whether in the land of Israel or outside, uh, prior to Jesus, of course, many changes in the time since. So the hymns themselves overall do celebrate uh, deliverance, whether deliverance from Egypt or deliverance from darkness or deliverance through Christ in the first century. Um, 
the Holy Week asked the Holy Week hymns that most concern us from Thursday night and especially thurs especially Thursday night and Friday morning are bookended on either side with, of course, Palm Sunday and Pascha. And if one compares the hymns of Palm Sunday and Pascha, one finds that the hymns, those hymns are in many ways much less historically oriented in the sense that they're full of eschatological hope, uh, expressing what is known best from the New Testament, I suppose, uh, Ephesians ideal hope of the unity of Jew and Gentile and all people who have brought who have been brought together in either the joy um, in the joy of both Palm Sunday and especially on Pascha. But of course, as we get to Thursday night uh, and pockets on the way, but I'm just not emphasizing those, but as we get to Thursday night and uh, Friday morning, we get a more historicized, uh, that's not the best word to use, but a more historical look at the crucifixion story of Jesus. And uh, as I'm, I, George meant, hinted briefly, this historical celebration of the feasts of Holy Week really originates in Jerusalem in the uh, fourth century, it seems, in connection with the holy, the, the holy sites themselves. Um, and so as we look at these particular hymns, this is in these hymns of Thursday night and Friday morning that we find the most, the, the hymns of greatest concern for those concerned with portrayals of uh, Jews. And I would argue that three primary elements uh, shape the current or, or, or have, have gone into the current shape of these hymns. First, Byzantine rhetorical culture. Secondly, biblical precedent. Uh, and then especially the third, the theological emphasis one finds throughout Eastern Christian and Orthodox theology, which is, which is a juxtaposition of the divine and human in the economy and person of Christ, a deliberate and ongoing juxtaposition. So the first of these, Byzantine rhetorical culture. As Plenty will know well, much of the hymnography, at least the rhetorical shape of them, comes from uh, are, are very greatly indebted to Byzantine rhetorical culture, in this case, especially the rhetorical form of psogos or invective. These are to be distinguished from other rhetorical forms, which uh, might, like kinostopos, which calls for pro or proposes judgment on one's enemies. This uh, psogos is described in the rhetorical handbooks as slander alone. It's just the way one talks about one's uh, opposition or enemies. So I won't say much about that. A lot of work has been done about that. The second point I would like to make um, is that a lot of the hymns are inheritances or deeply shaped by biblical precedent, especially from the prophets. Um, you find this first, for example, in Palm Sunday, where much of the Palm Sunday hymns express a lot of the post-exilic hopes of the, of, of the inclusion of the Gentiles and the final people of God that you get in places like second, or depending on how you describe it, second or third Isaiah. Um, and then also in the whole in the Holy Thursday and Holy Friday morning hymns, you find the same prophetic inspiration, but prophetic, I mean the biblical prophets. Uh, because it's in these hymns, especially, given that the Holy Week itself commemorates both as one unit of celebration, the Exodus as deliverance through Moses and deliverance through Christ, you find in these hymns a deliberate emphasis on the God of Exodus um, delivering his own. People. And a lot of the rhetoric comes from the prophets, which perhaps I'll come back to, but I did want to emphasize that a lot of it is prophetically oriented uh, and originated. The third thing I would like to emphasize and spend a little bit more time on um, is the theological emphasis of the hymns. The hymns themselves, uh, as practiced in most parishes, are very emphatically indebted to what I would argue is a wider theological motif in Orthodox Christianity uh, and Greek patristic and elsewhere, going back very, to, <clears throat> going back very very many years and centuries, which juxtaposes deliberately juxtaposes the divine taking on the human. In patristic thought, the word you often find to describe this is sin katavasis, which quite literally. Uh, literally means condescension, although that doesn't have quite the same connotation in English. But it's the idea that expresses the marvel, marvels at the fact that God has uh, taken on all of the bad stuff associated with being human, um, has condescended to our level in order to make himself, uh, or to, to, to make himself more receivable by his people. You get this in many different ways. Uh, in patristic and Eastern theology, and you also get this especially in the Holy Week hymns. Um, <clears throat> so the hymns themselves 
while they are definitely inspired, very much and thoroughly inspired by certain readings of the prophets and then especially the gospels, they do not merely convey or repeat the basic um, scriptural, or if you want to call it historical, at least surface literal reading of the gospels, but instead accentuate and emphasize the juxtaposition of the divine and the human. And so we have throughout the hymnography of the year, we have the virgin who gives birth, and then especially here, we have the God who suffers, the incorruptible becoming corruptible, the author of life being subject to death. Uh, and then especially the God of Exodus, and this is where I think the majority of the references to Jews really takes its shape, the God of Exodus being rejected by the people whom he delivered. That very much uh, is a further incarnation of the deliberate juxtaposition between the divine and the human. Thus, the hymns themselves do not simply restate that Jesus stood before Pilate in judgment, uh, Pilate and Caiaphas. Instead, the hymns themselves emphasize that the, that the uh, eternal judge stands before a temporal judge, that the lawgiver is crucified by the lawless. That's the rhetorical emphasis of the hymns. Um, and as famously noted, and George kind of mentioned, uh, although here, maybe for later on, I would disagree with George's characterization of this point, but as George mentioned, the hymns um, de-emphasize the involvement of Romans, and in this case, especially Pilate. And here, I would argue it's not necessarily born from a deliberate um, a deliberate in intention to distance ourselves from Roman cult culpability, but largely do to this juxtaposition of the divine and human, because for a God, for the God of Exodus to be uh, rejected by a pagan judge is nothing significant, but for the God of Exodus to be rejected by the people whom he delivered is a far more sign theological significance. And I think that sort of thing is throughout the hymnography, and you can see it in the parallelisms in the Greek, where we have lawgiver juxtaposed with, juxtaposed, uh, juxtaposed with the lawless, or, um, or the one who gave the law, uh, juxt juxtaposed with those outside the law, anomos and paranomos are the two that you find the most often, uh, which are words rooted in the prophetic and psalmic literature, but I think are uh, uh, here have the intention of conveying the, uh, again, juxtaposition of the significance of the fact that the divine has um, taken on the human. Um, and so that that's mostly what I want to summarize those, those three major points from the article. So for me, again, to recap what I have said very briefly here, uh, a lot of, the, if you take the hymns in a more synchronic notion, understanding the theological emphases and roots of the particular hymns, um, so as to keep those in mind, should we consider discussions of or emendations or, or changes? Uh, uh, first, many of the hymns are rooted in classically Byzantine uh, re re rhetoric. Uh, and here I mean Byzantine in a historical sense, not Byzantine in the negative sense that it's often used. And I want to add that given Father Jeffrey's earlier term uh, mention of the problem with the term Pharisaical, I would also add Byzantine um, as a derogatory term, which I think uh, George might sympathize with in some, in some ways. Uh, secondly, is the, the biblical precedent that one finds in the hymns of the use of the prophets and the Psalms. For describing God's rejection for, uh, by his own people. And then especially the third is a stems from a deliberate juxtaposition of uh, the divine and the human, the author of life being subject to death, the incorruptible being subject to corruptible, the God of Exodus being abandoned by the those whom he delivered. Uh, and this is rooted in a very ancient notion of sin kitavasis, of all of the things God takes on um, for human uh, salvation. Thank you, Father Michael. So again, um... We'll open this up to clarifying questions at this point. If there was anything that um, has been said that people need a little bit further explanation of or clarification of, we can take that now. Otherwise, these themes can be indeed brought into the full discussion um, later. Going once, going twice. Okay, I guess you were very clear, which is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so now Svetlana Panic. Um, Svetlana has worked as a journalist, a coordinator for the Association of Christian Schools International, a researcher at the Institute of Jewish Studies and the Center of European Studies and Humanities of the National University Kiev Mohila Academy, and a lecturer in literature at St. Andrew's Biblical Theological Institute, and as a researcher at the Alexander Solzhenitsyn Center of Russian Emigre Studies. She is currently here in Toronto conducting research into the life and work 
of Ilya Fundaminsky, one of the Paris martyrs during the Second uh, World War, and who is himself a Jewish Christian and within the circle of Saint Maria of Paris and Father Lev Gillet. So um, wonderful kind of bringing connection uh, all around there, but over to you, Svetlana. Thank you, Father Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a chance to join this uh, extremely necessary talk. But before I will uh, share some uh, very preliminary remarks, I'd like uh, to make a clarification. I am not a specialist in the liturgical studies. Uh, my studies connect are connected uh, with uh, Jewish Christian issues uh, in the, uh, I would say, in the Eastern European culture and particularly in the Russian Orthodox Church. This issue is controversial, it's um, very painful, and one of the figures who helps me uh, to approach this issue, not an ideological or political question, but as uh, something that can be both challenging and uh, encouraging to find out a place of Jewish Christians inside the Orthodox Church. It, it, this figure is uh, Ilya Fandaminsky. He is not. He is not father, he is a lay person that is important, very important also for the general discussion. And uh, his uh, life, um, his activity uh, puts a lot of uh, questions um, about Jewish Christians in the Orthodox Church. But coming back to the issue of this discussion, um, if you don't mind, I would start with a story. Maybe 10 years ago, I was uh, at the conference in Kazan Theological Academy. It is not the most fundamentalistic academy in the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, before the conference, I looked uh, through various educational materials and among the handouts you know, for, mature, for church Slavonic language, I found grammar exercises based on the following texts. So these are texts of uh, Thursday night uh, service and uh, Friday morning. As uh, someone who used to teach uh, Church Slavonic, I can say that the exercises themselves were very nice uh, uh, to identify grammar forms and explain the usage of them to decline nouns, etc., etc. However, anyone who did at least basic pedagogics knows the rule described all already in 17th century by Jan Amos Kamensky. Any text that is given for a language exercise shapes the general vision of the world, God, and humans. Or as uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, would say, it forms the intellect or intellectus. So the intellectus of those future priests was formed that way, that they didn't see any wrong in using such texts as, either as a grammar exercise or during the worship of the Holy Week. Moreover, they accustomed to use these texts almost unconsciously without making any theological connections with the big context of the Holy Scripture and with the historical contexts. Uh, they were not anti-Semitic, these guys. They were just a custom. For them, it was an absolute givenness that cannot be put under the question. The mental and spiritual picture produced by this givenness is described brilliantly by Father Alexander Schmian in the famous passage from his journals, um, Friday, he wrote, is indeed the, re the revelation of evil and sin in their full horror. But Byzantine hymnographers are engrossed with beating and blaming the guilty ones. We are witnesses. We are judges. We feel pity for Christ 
and condemn the guilty. Our conscience is clear because we supposedly know and stand for the, on the right side. What is lost is the very meaning of Holy Friday. Everybody betrays Christ. The end of the quote. Uh, following Father Alexander's uh, considerations, I would dare to see that such as them opposition discards the true scope of the event of the Holy Week, Holy Week and especially of Holy Friday and changes the very genre of the narrative. It transforms the unifying, universal, cosmic tragedy of Messiah's death, uh, tragedy that correlates with the same unifying, universal, and inclusive nature of the Feast of Feasts, uh, as uh, Father Michael Azar puts it, into rather primitive didactic performance like a school drama in which positive characters, we Christians rightly judge negative them. In the didactic play, positive heroes finally substitute negative ones and earn an award or at least a right to exclude or even to punish negative ones. However, when reading attentively anti-Jewish texts of the Holy Week, it becomes clear that in fact, not only Jews are excluded from the history of salvation as God killers, but we Christians are exclu also excluded. They are excluded from the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christians that be become kind of a separate entity standing not at the cross, but aside not participants, but spectators. Moreover, there is an evident striking contradiction between the anti-Jewish passages of Holy Week and, and on the one hand, and Pascal proclamation of the resurrection as a universal, all-embracing event, because the opposition as them deprives the resurrection of its universality and turns it into the well-deserved award for the good characters. In this logic, Paschal Christ's reason sounds more like applauses to the positive characters and their friends than as a proclamation of the victory over the last enemy. The enormous complexity of the New Testament narrative of the um, Christ, Christ's uh, passions, uh, death, and resurrection is reduced this way to a very primitive story of goddess and his enemies. The stories uh, that are typical uh, for many mythological systems. That is even more important that black and white story deprives Christians of their responsibility for the everyday crucifixion, as Father Alexander May used to see. It changed the very idea of repentance, substituting it with a scrupulous calculation of do's and don'ts. And at the same time, it provokes and even encourages revenge, <laughs> revenge as a just end of the positive character towards the villains. It is enough to look at the collections of, the, of sermons for the Holy Week and Easter published in the Russian Empire in uh, the 19th, uh, the beginning of 20th century, uh, for to understand that most of them were influenced not by the gospel narrative, but by the primitive black and white story. It partly explains why Quite often, Jewish pogroms in the traditional uh, Orthodox uh, regions of the Eastern Europe were time to coincide with the Holy Week and with Easter time. 
uh, of course, uh, more liberal uh, or at least more educated clergy in the empire tried to prevent these acts of the Christians' vigilance, as a pogrom, as a pogrom makers called it. Thus, for instance, every April um, issue of the Christian World Christian World Monthly issued by issued in Kiev in the beginning of 20th century published explanations of the events of the Holy Weeks and Easter. As a Kiev uh, priest, uh, new martyr Anatoly Zurakovsky wrote on, in one of his articles in, on the meaning of, the, of Holy Friday, we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ, but not the, a, week, a victory over his nation. However, these were rather exclusions the common tendency was absolutely different. On another hand, a huge influence of the black and white narrative constructed by the anti-Jewish passages of the Holy Week explains why in the Jewish conscience, there is a heavy conflict between Passover or Pesach and so-called Christian Easter. Easter is taken as not only a foreign but as an evidently non-Jewish, even hostile feast. If we look, uh, for instance, at the uh, Eastern European Jewish memoirs of 19th beginning of 20th century, we found that a period between Passover and the first Easter week is, is described as a time of a great tension. Jewish population of settlements and cities were waiting for the Orthodox people coming to re revenge for their Jesus. And even if there were, there were not escalations of the open hostility, Easter still was understood by the most of Jews as a source of the potential danger, or at least as a period when anti-Semitic moods are openly legalized by the church. The scene, as I know, was in Bessarabia, in Romania, uh, but uh, I'm giving the examples of the Russian empire, be, not only because this is my uh, domain of studies, but also it proclaimed and still proclaims itself as a safeguard of the holy tradition and many vices of the so-called tradition later were exported to another place. Uh, what's happened now? Preparing to this discussion, I tried to make a very small survey, knowing well that this survey is far from being representative. Nevertheless, I have asked the, in Facebook my friends clergy for following questions. What are you doing with the anti-Jewish statements in the services of the Holy Week. The second, uh, if you read them, how do you think is it necessary to explain the meaning of those passages uh, to, the, uh, to your people, to your flock? And if so, how do you explain them? The third was how do your parishioners take these passages? And the last one, if you change them, what changes do you mean? I said that I have addressed uh, these questions uh, uh, to 20 clergy from Ukraine, Yellow Russia, Russia, Germany, Finland, France, and UK, so the diocese, 19 of them answered, and the results were following. The majority, 11 respondents, uh, See, said that they do their best to skip these passages at all. Um, geographically, they were people from France, UK, Ukraine, and Russia. Four persons of respondents said they, they read them. They were mostly people, for, only people from Yellow Russia and Russia. And uh, some, and uh, also four, said that they try to shorten or to change them, uh, priests from Finland, Germany, and Russia. There are, were also some significant comments. Thus, a priest from Belarus has, has written, we are 
reading these texts as they are. No one pays special attention to them. They are just accepted as a part of the tradition, the end of the quote. This answer makes one wonder what his parishioners are doing at the service of the Holy Week. If they don't pay attention at the anti-Jewish passages, does it mean they also pay, um, they also don't pay attention to anything else at the worship? or they are so selective. A lot of other questions immediately arise, for instance, about the mindfulness of the presence at the worship, about the understanding of the tradition, but these are out of the present time. A priest from Russia, he has answered that if it is possible, he tries to shorten these passages, but later he has written to me privately. Usually, he wrote, at the Holy Thursday, we have bishops' visitation, and of course, everything is read. On Holy Friday, I try to shorten, but people don't listen at all. Church Slavonic is foreign for them. They want just to have a spiritual atmosphere with smells and exclamations. There are few who are taking their Christianity seriously. I talk to them during the biblical readings, but now one have to be very careful because there is a lot of the Orthodox volunteers who are ready to inform Bishop about any shortenings or too liberal views, the end of the quote. A deacon from Stuttgart told that Germans who came to the Orthodox church were extremely sensitive to these passages. They were even denied to participate in the Holy Week worships. It resonates with the initial Bogdan Bukur's statement because for them, historical associations were unbearably clear. So they decided to skip these passages at all or to shorten them to such extent that anti-Semitic connotations could disappear at all. However, as they understood that to skip in this case means to escape from the bigger problem. And these texts demand not only changes of wording, but very deep theological rethinking. No less significant were comments of my Jewish friends, the posts in Facebook were open. Uh, they thank for these questions and said that for them, anti-Jewish passages of the Holy Week are one of the main obstacles preventing them from coming to the church. Finally, a very interesting example of contextual editing of these passages was given by Olga Meyerson, it's a well-known Christ the Savior parish in New York, a parish of Father Michael Meyerson. In our correspondence, Olga, uh, particularly told that from her experience, the main task is not a changing of the wording. The main task is to eradicate deviations in the in the conscience. Jews in the gospel are not they, but we, those who inherit the covenant. So it is we who are responsible for all. Renouncing Jews, we renounce Christ. The end of uh, the quote. The way of editing of this, or the ways of editing of these texts can be different. It uh, can be substitution of the certain words, or, or it can be more profound analysis of the uh, Jewish context of the scriptural allusions in these texts, but uh, the canceling of the opposition as them, or they betray in past, we judge them in present and forever for this, um, the canceling of this dichotomy for the sake of making transparent the very meaning of the narrative the uh, summit of evil, the judgment and the victory over it now here and, now, 
uh, now here and in us as father, Alexander Schmemann has put it, might suggest one of the strategies for the theological rethinking of the discussed um, passages. Um, on my opinion, in my opinion, uh, this uh, rethinking would help two sisters, church and synagogue, meet on the roads of history, as Mother Maria Spatsova once said. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana, um, uh, for bringing that Jewish Christian perspective, how, you know, despite all the synchronic or diachronic ways of looking at this, at the end of the day, we're left with stories that are all about us and them, and we need to do something about that, right? That um, whether it's, you know, focusing on the text or, or more comprehensively, I think, as you got to there, of saying we have to change our whole theology and mindset that there, so there isn't an us and them um, in play at all um, in this kind of black and white narrative uh, that we played. So again, as we said before, there are clarifying questions. I think Paul Ladoussard has a, has a clarifying comment. Uh, sorry, no, it's not really a clarifying comment. It's really getting into the substance of. of that. Okay, we're we're about to get there. We have about half an hour. I have about five minutes or so of of things to show you about practical things we do in our parish. But maybe I'll leave it for now. And if that if we have time for that, I can I can show a little bit of that before uh, the end, or if it comes up in in a question. You know, I can certainly do that. But otherwise, I'd like to open us up now because I know there's uh, interest here in asking questions. So maybe Paul, you had your hand up. We can start with you. I know there's a question in the chat as well that we'll pick up on. Yes. Well, perhaps uh, your slides from your parish might answer some of the questions. But uh, there's reference to do we expunge? the offending texts or do we rewrite them? My option would be very much for liturgical purposes uh, to uh, rewrite them. I mean, for example, uh, the offending texts as uh, uh, allegorical hymns, uh, we are the ones who crucify uh, Christ. Of course, of course, there are many hymns during the Lenten service which take exactly that line. Um, I was wondering if uh, either Otza or perhaps eventually through one of the orthodox uh, jurisdictions in North America, uh, couldn't prepare a kind of a, a book of alternative services where these could be offered uh, as an option for uh, parishes, which might not have the resources to be able to uh, rewrite them such that uh, from a hymnographic point of view, they would uh, make sense and work uh, in hymnography. But this, this would be sort of my suggestion. I don't know whether uh, George or, or Father Jeffrey or, or Michael, uh, Father Michael would like to sort of comment on this as approach, but I think this was the, the idea that was kind of floating around in, in, in Volos is that instead of talking about it, let's do something. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, the idea of the working group, um, uh, which came out of Volos is going ahead. So this is a way of launching it today and, and both people who are here as well as other people who are interested will take part in it. I think there'll be a few kind of outputs from that in the kind of early stages. One would be a kind of manifesto, just kind of summarizing the key goals and the point, you know, the theological considerations, as well as taking on board everything, you know, Father Michael has pointed out here as well. Um, I have in, in view a kind of good practice guide for parishes about it, because there are a whole lot, I mean, this exists primarily in translation as an issue, and already in English we have a dozen or more translations to choose from, right? Some of the slides that I maybe show towards the end can hint at some of this too, but it's some sort of guide, you know, for that, as well as the more comprehensive thing, going to bishops and to diocese and suggesting, you know, something more comprehensive. Father Michael. Uh, I did want to emphasize the the black book that uh, that George mentioned that is in use in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. The newer translation, or the newer, it's not really a newer translation, but change uh, does does make some significant changes um, to the hymns. It's not a matter of rewriting, but you know things that I wouldn't argue necessarily solve the issue, but they do make changes. You know, such as no longer saying Jews in key passages, but Judeans, or generalizing the term uh, to like the lawless in general, or something like that. Um, so there are, I mean, it, there, there are things underway for sure. The other other archdioceses, I can't really speak speak for. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah if I could jump in on, on this quickly. I know, so um, 
to, to use a parallel example, right? So you have this famous hymn for the Feast of the Cross. Um, in Greek, we know it as Soson Kyria, right? Um, grant victory to the emperor against the barbarians. Well, in, in a lot of ways, that like a, a literal translation of the original Byzantine text makes absolutely no sense. There's no emperor and who are the barbarians, right? <laughs> and and so um, a lot of times what happened, it doesn't happen in the GOA, but what happens in a lot of other traditions is grant, the emperor gets changed to um, the people, right? This happens in modern Greece. It happens in a lot of the English translations in the OCA and the Antiochians. And then the barbarians gets translated into their enemies or the enemy or, or something like that. And so there may be some, um, there may be, as Father Michael suggested, is already going on simply by publishers, right? There may be a way to simply keep hymns that we have and just tweak words. I, I mean, one of the problems with the Papadeus thing that, that Father Michael mentioned is it's only changing the English. It's not changing the Greek. Now, granted, nobody understands the Greek, right? Uh, I, I mean, we have 60 people on this call, and we probably have five that can translate it, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it is one step, but look, I, I mean, Alex Lingus is on is, is on this call. He, he knows all this better than anybody on the call, right? But until the printing press... <laughs> Um, monastic communities and communities were constantly testing and experimenting with new forms of hymnography. And the printing press um, or modernity seems to have brought that to a grinding halt. Uh, uh, and it has now become this notion that we, we are sort of instilled with this notion that if we introduce any new hymns, we are doing something untraditional. When in fact, the most traditional way to engage liturgy would be to simply continue to experiment and introduce new hymns and give parishes, give communities the freedom um, to do it. It's the printing press that that killed all of this. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I, I, I mean, yeah. I see you've got loads of hands up there, Father. Yeah, there's a question from the Q&A first. Um, so it takes us into the theological realm. Um, Ellen asks, on the question of deicide, if Christ had to die to save humanity, or at least to bring Gentiles to God or bring God to Gentiles, why are those who may have abetted the Roman execu execution subject to hatred? Should they not be celebrated as giving the greatest gift to the church? Um, and I think related to this is the point that, um, you know, often comes up. I mean, if, if this is being so condemned, how is it we can also in the same time talk about the voluntary death of Christ? You know, so it, it, again, maybe George or Father Michael. Father Michael. Yeah, I'll defer to Father Michael. Go ahead. So I would say, I mean, part of that. Well, I will say, first of all, the disclaimer, I have, I have issues with the characterization of deicide only because it is a widely applied term that often um, is used for texts that don't actually say things like that. Uh, but on the other hand, going back to what I wrote about, uh, this actually has significant, I mean, it comes from the prophets, and it really, I mean, the easiest example would be the plenty of laments um, in Jeremiah and Lamentations and things like that, that basically, you know, um, describe the exile, the, the early sixth century exile. Uh, happening because of our own sins god did it to us because of our own sins but then also revel in how you know terrible the babylonians are um there is i mean so this 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 juxtaposition or this disconnect or, or this tension i mean i i think is rooted in in the biblical understanding of um you know god ultimately being in control of things or things happening because of our sins but also it was the babylonians that did it uh kind of thing so i that's nothing particularly new i think Okay, um, let's move on to Michael Sisko. He's got his hand up. Hey, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I heard theological considerations mentioned as a motivation, so I guess I have a theological question. Is the Orthodox Church the true inheritor of the promises of Israel, or is there a sort of dual covenant, uh, one, one for us and another that's acceptable for people of the Judaic faith that still deny Christ. I'm a historian, so I'll leave it to the priest. <laughs> I'm a theologian, I'll also leave it to priests. 
Me, well, can I just make a comment and say, I mean, there's a far bigger question than can be answered here, but it is the kind of question that Orthodox Christians need to be asking and talking about, which we haven't. Certainly not the way that, and this is kind of what I hinted at in my opening remarks, that the way that various Western Christians have begun to really wrestle with these questions. I mean, as it's an issue in the New Testament, right? Um, St. Paul, you know, in Romans 9 to 11 is wrestling with precisely, you know, this kind of, uh, of issue. Um, I think an increasing number of people in light of what we now know about Second Temple Judaism, about the various Judaisms of the first century, about Christianity, not really being Christianity until much later, but being a form of Judaism. I think the, the kinds of answers we're coming to now are, are interesting and exciting and have a lot of, of, of substance you know, behind them, but, but too few Orthodox are involved in that conversation. And uh, I mean, I certainly want to be part of it. And I know, you know, kind of growing number uh, of people, you know, want to be. But to, to, to take what I mentioned earlier from Father Lev Gillet, um, so that was someone who did, you know, in 1941, you know, 42, when his book was was published, but but he's a real prophet. And, and this was long before Nostra Etate, let alone before the full horrors of the Shoah, you know, were known. But he clearly comes to an understanding that all those who relate to the one true God of Israel are in communion, even if imperfectly, in the Messiah, right? So that includes the kind of coordinated ecclesiology that should be at the heart of the church, both Jewish and Gentile on an ongoing basis. There should be a, a recognizably Jewish Christianity as well as a Gentile Christianity, but also including those people who continue, uh, who at this point have not recognized in Jesus the Messiah. But nevertheless, Father Lev's point is that actually a lot of those people are more messianic than the Christians. The Christians claim Jesus as a savior, but don't understand what a Messiah is. Whereas a lot of Jews know darn well what a Messiah is and live lives towards the Messianic kingdom without necessarily claiming, you know, Jesus. So he says all are necessary. He actually calls for a mission of the church to the Jews and a mission of the Jews to the church in this kind of friendly, coordinated covenant uh, kind of thing. But again, this is a conversation that needs to be had. It's, it's the kind of thing that would be really interesting for Orthodox Christians to explore theologically. And it wasn't part of our discourse. And, and it's certainly not in any of these hymns. That would be part of the, it would be lovely to compose things that talked about this so that people would have some direction to think about this. Good morning, and thank you all for the excellent uh, discussion so far. I apologize for being outside if you hear wind noise. Figured that was the spirit. More, more... <laughs> exactly. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, the first is uh, sort of in response to some of the material that Dr. Demacopoulos went over, particularly the uh, with regard. One of the questions that came to my mind when he was recounting the uh, depredations uh, carried out under the name of the Emperor Justinian, the question came to my mind: Should we keep commemorating him as a saint? Uh, uh. That that doesn't feel quite uh, right, uh, at least to me. Uh, but uh, that, that was the first question that popped into my head. The, the uh, further questions, though, which are sort of more general and in response to both the presentations and just the broader subject matter. First of all, I would ask, uh, to what degree has the anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism of Orthodox hymnography, uh, do we think, contributed to the anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic politics that we see in, have seen historically in a number of traditionally Orthodox countries, as well as to the rise of reactionary and overtly fascist politics among at least a, 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 a very small but vocal minority of Orthodox laity in America. Uh, I'm particularly concerned here as someone who is queer and uh, whose partner is Jewish. Um, and as a result of that and other things, I don't really go to church anymore. Um, it's been made very clear to me that I'm not welcome. Um, but the connection between anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and the so-called culture war issues, with things like, uh, you know, with, particularly with regards to sexuality and gender, but broader uh, issues, makes me very concerned about, about this. And I wonder to what degree the hymnography has played a role in this. Um, 
don't know if there is a specific answer, but some reflections on that would be appreciated. And also to some of the other discussions about practical things to do, I just, I wonder what we can do, not just in terms of changes to or comp composition of new liturgical texts, but just in the day-to-day -day life of our parishes to eject anti-Semitism from the church and to address the historic complicity of us Gentile Christians in anti-Semitism and the related political movements that have come out of the European Christian anti-Semitic uh, tradition. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, so let, let me start on the, should we commemorate him as a saint? Um, so this will might surprise everybody on this call. Um, no Byzantine Christian regarded Justinian as a saint. Not, not, not a single one. There, there is absolutely zero record of a cult for Justinian um, anywhere in the world until after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire. Um, and in fact, uh, in modern um, Orthodox liturgical calendars, there are 12 Byzantine emperors that, whose names um, are there. They don't necessarily have hymns or full-blown feasts or anything, but their names are there for commemoration. Um, with the possible exception of Constantine, um, and his is kind of an open question, um, none of those other 11 were commemorated by the Byzantines. Those are all post-Byzantine sort of nostalgic efforts to go back to a imperial model where emperors were saints. The Byzantines themselves knew very well that none of these emperors were good guys. Um, uh, in terms of your uh, in in terms of your your question about you know is, is there a causal link between the hymns and ev everything else that happens? Um, I'm not in a position to demonstrate that there is. Um, I, I think this would be the work of anthropologists and sociologists and perhaps historians. Um, I, I, I mean, it seems self-evident that there likely is a connection. Um, uh, and um, But I don't know that it's a direct one-to-one. -one. I, I, I don't know how you would go about proving a direct one-to-one -one causal relationship that it's this and nothing else. It kind of ties to the general question of, I mean, even question was asked in light of the Shoah, the Holocaust, you know, what what causality was there from Christians and their kind of theology and so forth? It, I mean, certainly the stereotypes, the tropes, the the the, the low-grade general anti-Semitism allowed something to happen that should have been unthinkable, right? So whether well, you it, draw a direct line of causality is always the question. It, it, what, if, if I can really quickly and then go, go to the others, please. One of the things I've discovered in my research on hymns is the hymns typically lag other things, right? So in other words, we had ample evidence of anti-Judaism in other kinds of Christian writing before it appeared in hymnography, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, you had ample forms of Christian sacralizing violence before it appeared in hymnography. So in the kind of genealogy of Christian reflection on things, hymnography tends to lag rather than lead. Um, but that's not to say that in the modern world it's not it, it it's not doing that right um svetlana and father mike i think also want to weigh in on this when i started when i started to study uh, the collection of the orthodox sermons of 19th uh, um, the beginning of 20th century it was evident that hymnography influences the rhetorics, the poetics, imaginary of these sermons. But the same time, when we take a very concrete historical situation in the empire, the same time, the, the general politics of the empire was also anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. And I would not say that this politic was supported by uh, hymnography or the hymnography influenced this politics uh, be also because uh, in this situation, 
when the majority of people are coming to the church, I would say unconsciously, because this is the situation of the formal uh, of the formal piety of the piety that is taken as a tradition. Uh, I don't think that they would seriously reflect on those hymnog uh, those hymnography patterns. But anyway, the general picture, the most general picture of the church saying, let's say something negative against those Jews, of course, shaped the public opinion and public attitude to the Jewish minorities for many, many centuries, uh, especially in the Eastern Europe. I know this region quite well. Uh, but I am not sure that this is a reality of nowadays because uh, many uh, people who are coming to the churches more or less mindfully, uh, they have the idea of the so-called post-Holocaust, post-Shoah values. And the uh, situation when People came out of the churches just because they, they cannot hear these anti-Semitic passages is very typical for the current world. Mm -hmm. I have, I have um, asked many people who went out of the church uh, uh, the last years, uh, the last decade, uh, decade I, was, I would say, about the reasons of their saying goodbye to the uh, former Orthodox practices. And this, and as, as one of their reasons, they said the, uh, still they said that they can not bear these still anti-Semitic paradigms in something that is presented as, a th as theology of passions and theology of Easter. Okay. I, Thank you. And the and of course it, it uh, uh, gives a huge challenges mm -hmm. to those who are still speaking from the name of the church. Um, hi everyone, and thank you for organizing this. For those of you who don't know, I'm um, my name is Bruce Beck. I'm a professor of New Testament at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, and also um, on their administration. I want to just make a, a, a couple of quick comments. I agree with uh, Father Michael um, in responding to George's paper that, um, you know, the problem of Jewish Christian relations is already um, very much baked into the, the New Testament scriptures and that um, our challenge is, you know, goes all the way back to the beginning. Um, of course, of course, it progresses, but you know, the hymnology, um, and also George was just saying that hymnology kind of follows some of that. Um, I think one of the things that we can do is, in, we're, those of us who are responsible for um, theological education, it's a big emphasis that we uh, train the, you know, train our, our professors to be able to teach that way. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention is that, um, I think one of the things that this group should do, at least in some of the work groups, is to make sure that we bring uh, Jewish colleagues um, into um, into our midst so that we're not just talking as Christians. Um, I, I think it's very important that we all get to know um, uh, Jewish colleagues, whether it's theological colleagues or others, um, because that makes a, a deep, deep impressions and so that we're not just kind of listening to our own own voices. I know that um, uh, many of us have benefited from from being involved in theological education with um, with Jewish uh, teachers, and that has made lasting impressions on us. So I just wanted to um, to mention that briefly. Thank you. Anybody want to respond to that? I mean, Father Michael, 
you know, you've been doing that for years, and I think that's certainly the plan in the working group is to have uh, consultants and friends and and colleagues who are from the Jewish tradition, so that we can we can hear directly those voices. I, I will just add something very briefly. I, I mean, I entirely agree with that sentiment of bringing more Jewish colleagues into this, and I think one unique aspect that the Orthodox per, perhaps can also bring that. Uh, has been left out, to be honest, of much of Jewish Christian dialogue elsewhere is um, uh, we, we can at least contribute non-European and non-North Atlantic and non-North American perspectives more and more. Because um, I think there's a great risk and a great disservice done to Jewish Christian relations when it's exclusively focused on a European and North American um, context, especially in disregarding other places where his orthodoxy has a historical root, most in, especially as the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And and to the point, I mean, where Orthodox and Jews live side by side and have been, you know, having those kinds of engagements for for some time. So involving that is is really key. Okay, we'll we'll um, draw the line at uh, we we'll have Svantia's question and then Hermina and then um, there's a call for me to go th quickly through those slides that I, I promised earlier. So and we'll wrap things up. We'll probably a little bit after five o'clock. So if you can stick around, please do. If you can't, this is being recorded and you can catch up um, later on. So hopefully we've unmuted you now, Svante. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists for your wonderful presentations. Um, uh, Professor Dimakopoulos, it's, it's taking me so much effort not to call you Father George. Um, <clears throat> did a wonderful job outlining in, in his presentation about how diverse um, Byzantine practice was um, pre-printing press and uh, how the, the rights that we have now are the product of, you know, to some degree, a pruning of um, liturgical traditions, both with um, occupation of Constantinople and, you know, the printing press, essentially creating sort of a canon. Um, I'm certainly not against writing new hymns for you know, to take the place of the problematic ones, but to what extent are we looking at um, either you know extinct liturgical practices from the Byzantine past, or separate question, um, perhaps interesting analogous ideas from uh, Syriac or you know non uh, Coptic churches uh, to see how they handle similar issues to perhaps like either gain insight or you know, bring into the modern day something that, because of its roots in the past, um, might be more acceptable to people who are nervous about change. Yeah, uh, that that that's a really interesting. Um, that's a really interesting point. I, I mean, historically, of course, there was a lot of interaction, um, and a lot of cross pollinization of of hymnographic forms. I I, I mean, the whole contagion. Um, thing that Romanos does in Constantinople is is derivative of uh, Syriac, which is itself derivative of contemporary Jewish practice and and so forth. I don't know this history. Um, there are people on this call who who know it better than me. Um, I I think that would I, I I think it's a great suggestion that any sort of recommendations that we as a group might eventually make to the assembly of bishops should incorporate that kind of looking what what's been done in other um, ancient Orthodox uh, non Greek communities and 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 how they've dealt with these issues. Thank you, Father Michael. Um, it was kind of implied earlier, but one thing I'd say, you know, because. Uh, for those maybe incredibly resistant to emendations, which I should say I'm not, I might not go as, I might not be as supportive of certain aspects of it as other people on this call, to be honest. Um, but for those that are resistant, there's plenty, I don't, I think it might have been Father Jeffrey that suggested, I'm not sure, but there's plenty in the liturgy itself uh, where we could use to, you know, let liturgy interpret itself, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, and I think George's point about Soso and Kiri and the way we've allegorized that is also very significant. Um, point because our spiritual tradition is full of this right of allegorizing like psalm 137 and the vicious things it says about babylonians um the tradition is taken to be very spiritual like spiritual enemies uh you know and so so and kitty as well but um yeah I, I think this notion of like letting liturgy interpret itself could actually be a nice middle ground for those that, that are pushing for emendations and also those that are that are a little more hesitant yeah i mean related to that is the whole question of the the New Testament texts themselves, which nobody is suggesting that we go and amend or omit right. or, you know, do something with. But and that's definitely where we need to let the New Testament interpret itself and the whole patristic tradition and the liturgical tradition, you know, thereafter, because these things have a context. They have, 
uh, a voice, they have a rhetoric, you know, to them. And it's the point I made in my preliminary remarks as well about if we are going to use those words, we need to make darn sure that we are close to the people who spoke them in the first place. And so understand Jesus and the apostles within Judaism and not as an other, to Svetlana's point about this constant us and them dynamic that, that that's there. So part of just that transformation allows us to use these texts uh, like the New Testament or, or some of the liturgical texts as well. But our last question will be from Nina, and then I will uh, give you some practical things that we do in our parish as a, as a guide. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nina Nagamasu. I'm a neuroscientist and a theologian in training at the Graduate Theological Union. I have two questions and a brief uh, comment. My first question is, if I, under, if I heard correctly, the role of Pilate is diminished in these hymns, if I heard correctly, and I'd like to know what might the benefit of that have been to diminish his role. My second question is, I often hear my chanter's friends say that there are changes in the digital chant stand, which is an online text that many churches actually use. And I wonder if you have thought about uh, working with them to um, correct some of these hymns because um, they are ubiquitously used in, in at least the GOA. And I checked for the Holy Thursday and the anti-Jewish rhetoric is, is certainly still there. But I am aware that if there are changes that have been um, done in the digital chance stand. And it just seems like a source. Um, and, and this is just to echo what Paul was saying. What can we do now? Because I think the situation is immediate. And this is my comment. As a neuroscientist, even though um, Professor Svetlana, you mentioned that people come unconsciously to the church, actually our environment hugely influences us. It's like, even if they come unconsciously, these kind of rhetoric does influence the way we think and it's 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 a type of conditioning that takes place even if people are not aware of it so i think it's urgent to change it that's all thank you so so i'll answer the question um uh and taking into account i know what father michael has been pushing me to be alert, alert to um so there there are about a thousand hymns that pre that that predate the 12 that I started talking about and now it's a thousand so you can cover a lot of different ground as a whole those hymns focus on the kind of ontological significance of the resurrection they're not they're typically not focused on the historical events of the crucifixion and resurrection they're they're more big big picture however when they do go into history Pilate's there, the soldier's there. I don't ever recall Pilate's wife, but in other words, some of the Romans are mentioned sometimes in, in, in those texts. My point is that in, in these 12, they move away from the ontological and they move to the historical. And in their move towards the historical, they focus exclusive. There, there's this kind of rhetorical refrain that appears in, in several of them where it's Jesus versus the Jews. Um, and my observation is simply, it, it's a move to do a kind of historical move rather than an ontological move, but it only tells a little bit of the story. And the real significance, and this is here, I'd go back to the question raised by Michael, where, where he wanted to say, you know, is there a difference be, like, as Orthodox, do we claim the, the truth or do we not? I think that's the point he's getting to. Um, the point is, my response to that is that the theological move is dramatically and profoundly different in these new hymns. It is a theological innovation to claim some external group killed Jesus rather than to claim we killed Jesus, right? That is a theological change that is fundamentally inconsistent with the 500 previous years of singing about this event, right? Um, Father Michael, I can answer for him. Father Michael would say, well, these hymns aren't going to be interested in Pilate because by definition, they're seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of scripture. So they're only going to focus on this, on the characters of scripture, the Jews and, and, and so forth. So anyway, so that was my answer to that. And I'll, um, uh, Anyway, so that was okay. the first one. Uh, Svetlana, a comment? A uh, very brief uh, comment uh, to the Hermina's remark. When I'm saying that people are coming to the church unconsciously, I mean that 
they don't have a habit, they don't have a custom to think about the meanings of the liturgical or hymn words or hymnographics just because the take is as a, something sacred and sacred for them is let's call it a closed system it does not it doesn't demand any hermeneutical effort for understanding and as a result we can find uh, especially in the traditional churches in the trad very traditional orthodox churches we can find those who say i am not anti-semitic but jews killed christ and the it, do, it doesn't seem as a real country is a real uh, contradiction but this is let, let's say this is my personal position this is that i am hearing at the uh, church service without trying to understand what in fact is said in this uh, corpus of texts and here I would support the uh, idea of Father Michael that we don't need, in fact, any principally new texts, but because the existing the existing set of hymnography allows to make the rest thinking. I'm still in, in, I'm still insisting on this word to make the rethinking of the narratives taking into account first those meanings of the words that are coming from the Jewish tradition, uh, those exumerans that are appearing in the existing liturgical texts when uh, the Jewish tradition doesn't take, take, is not taken into account. And the second, to rethink the poetics, the, um, including the poetics of contradictions of the uh, hymnography, and uh, to and making any additions, try not to uh, destroy the poetical, the literary, and yes, the poetical level of these texts. That is also very important. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add very briefly. Um, I, it's important to emphasize that the hymns, I think, in many ways, are not entirely consi consistent. Like I don't think there's a strong. I mean, maybe the introduction historically of of, of blaming Jews, so to speak, is there, but there's not a strong consistency. Uh, I mean, you could comb through the hymns and see all of the terrible things they say about Gentiles for their idolatry and being lost in darkness and things like that. And I think that's important there. Uh, and the first person blame is still very much there as well. I mean, the one that most comes to mind uh, is in the holy, in the royal hours where some of the more egregious hymns that George has unpacked for us um, occur, where the where they the the speaker, the reader, um, says the words of the prayer of Azariah, asking God not to annul his covenant with us for the sake of your beloved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not forsake us. Um, so I think is a really striking addition amid many of the, the hymns that George has, um, has unpacked. And I think it's important to be aware of. Let me just share um, kind of a, as a way of bringing some of this together, because I've really, really enjoyed the conversation today. I hope you all have as well. But what we do at a kind of local uh, level ourselves. So um, just a few re brief remarks here about assessing the liturgical texts um, that we have. It is a synchronous thing. It, it has come to us as a package. Um, although to her, uh, uh, Hermina's point, um, uh, what's interesting about something like a digital chant stand is the possibility of getting back before the printing press, right? Because printed books are one thing, they're locked in covers and hardcover and they're on your shelf. But a digital chant stand, I think, is maybe a way forward that gets us back to which scroll are we going to pull out of the bundle this year and sing, because it gives that flexibility that I think so many of us who are in Orthodox liturgics would crave. Um, I want to just quickly run through some of the, the problem of isolating texts from liturgical events. There's more to these things than just words on a page, right? They happen within a liturgical context. There's preaching, there's teaching, there's iconography, there's ritual and everything. So let's not focus 
only and always on just words on a page. Um, historical context, we've heard a lot about that from, from George today. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is that throughout our liturgical hymnography, we talk about today. And I think this introduces an interesting problematic because it's not just about we're returning to a moment in the past in a historicization sense, but today becomes the moment these things are happening. So I think we need to be careful about the terms in which we're expressing that because it's not just the context of first century Jerusalem that matter, it's our own context if it is indeed a today um, kind of event. We need to acknowledge Hellenistic, Byzantine rhetoric, and intra-Jewish polemic without accepting them as excuses. I think preserve the poetry, preserve the theology, preserve the Christology, but let's, we, we're no longer in a, you know, a tradition where, you know, Sogos and, and, and some of these other um, elements of rhetoric are uh, in play. I think this comes a lot out of what George was telling us earlier. What is the theology of the story we're telling? in the way that we're telling it? Are we faithfully in interpreting and proclaiming the gospel narrative? And what have we left out of the liturgical narrative? That goes more to what is the what compositions or new elements within liturgical events can come into play. So after assessment, these are things that we've kind of looked at um, ourselves. There's textual solutions, omitting, retranslating or glossing, amending texts or composing and replacing. But I also want to emphasize the context elements here, preaching, teaching, possibly just simply annotating texts, um, and then composing in the sense of expanding the narrative uh, as it's told. I think at a local parish level, the ones that really are in play are the ones I put into italics here. Uh, it's hard to imagine a parish going out of its way to actually full scale amend existing texts or, or make new compositions. So I'm going to just give you some examples of what we do. In terms of omitting, um, pretty obvious. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but here in this midst of this beautiful poetic passage about, you know, all the things that happened when Christ was crucified, uh, the curtain, the tombs, the centurion, all gospel elements, we have this phrase, for by thy lifting up today the Hebrew race perished. Problematic because, well, that's not what race is anyway. Um, you know, and I think we're human race, and to introduce anything else into our theology is really problematic, not just for anti Judaism, but for racism, full stop. Uh, but even that expression of theology is, is problematic. Here's just a simple take it out. That's not needed in this passage, it's relatively easy to excise. But on the omission side of things, I think the other thing that's possibly an interesting thing to do, here's what I'm not particularly happy with the, the language of retribution. We've spoken today about incitement to go and exact revenge or to or to be violent towards the, the them. We've uh, us and them the thing, and now we want to go and have uh, violence against that. Render unto them, O Lord, according to their works. You know, this whole idea of divine retribution. It does have biblical precedent and warrant. Jeremiah, you know, is very, very clear. It's the Israelites' fault, but it's also the Babylonians, and by golly, God should go and wreak vengeance on them. But here, where I say omit, rather than just excising them, and, and you may choose otherwise, you may choose to keep this, but if you do excise it, why not keep it in the text if you have a printed book of some kind, but annotate why you're no longer saying it? I think it's important to document this, right? To say this was part of the tradition and we are choosing not to do this, not just simply to erase it. It's a bit like cancel culture or, you know, knocking down statues. Those statues should be preserved and put in a museum with a plaque that says, you know, what the historical context was about. So this is the kind of thing we would do is, is annotate this and say, informed by our Lord's call from the cross to forgive those who do not know what they do, we omit today the following stanzas calling for retribution. Any prayer that God render to anyone according to their works must be for his righteousness enacted in long-suffering love and forgiveness as it always is towards us all. Now, just take this as a, as a model, an example of the kind of thing that can be done rather than analyzing this particular um, example. The thing we do a lot more of is this retranslating or glossing. Now, it does trespass unto amending. I'll get you, give you that. But we have scope because of the plethora of translations and just this idea that 
already exists in a lot of Orthodox parishes. Choir directors do this all the time. They choose a different word because it fits the meter better, right? Uh, even if it's the accepted translation they're receiving, they will make changes all the time. So within that scope, I think local parishes can do things. Um, after this beautiful, you know, Antiphon 15, George mentioned, it's the power, most powerful hymn of, of Holy Week with all this beautiful paradoxical language. Of course, we follow up this sublime expression with, let us not keep festival as the Jews, right? Um, well, back down to earth with a thumb, right? Um, this is where we would just retranslate that as, let us faithfully keep the feast for Christ our God in Passover is sacrificed, you know, for us. Quite straightforward. Um, or things like, you know, expressions like the, the uh, upon whom a price had been set by the sons of Israel. Sounds like a whole group is in play, a whole people is in play. Whereas the gospel story accurately is the rulers of Israel. Very simple. Um, what, these kinds of expressions, the assumption that only Gentiles are present, that there no longer is a Jewish church and a uh, church of St. James. We Gentiles sing of the O pure Theotokos. Well, as you know, the word Gentiles is the same word for nations, ethni, right? From all nations, we sing of the opior theotokos. It, it, it's hardly, uh, you know, much of a, a, a moving away from, from the original words. A people that transgress the law. Again, this idea of collectively holding a whole people responsible is problematic, right? So rather, a people that transgress the law, those who transgress the law. We're keeping all the poetics, we're keeping all the theology, we're just modifying the translation ever so slightly. This is the one that's a little bit more um, involved here. This is one of these prophetic imprecations, right? Micah 6 uh, and, and, and reprised here, the Lord saying, oh my people, what have I done to thee? Wherein have I wearied thee, etc." It's towards the end here. We have, I can endure no more. I shall call my Gentiles and they shall glorify me with the Father and the Spirit and I shall bestow on them eternal life, which of course reads as in a very uh, strong and hard supersessionist, you know, kind of way. The Jews have been set aside, and now the Gentiles have come in. Again, just by way of retranslating, don't think we need, thus says the Lord to the Jews, just thus says the Lord, but the word for endure also means wait. I can wait no more. I can no longer hold back. I shall call all nations to me and all shall glorify me. This idea of openness, of expansiveness, of inclusion rather than us and them. I think those are examples of the retranslating and gloss. I cannot overestimate preaching and teaching. This is by far and away the main thing that has to happen at every local parish. It, it involves relationships with local synagogues, local Jewish leaders, local Jewish people as well, but get people to know more of the Christian story, the, the whole scriptural story of God, understand how Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, how he encapsulates and, and sums up all of Israel. And in fact, more than that, and this is where some of the recent scholarship and theology is going, his crucifixion is a proleptic anticipation of the hardening of the exile of Israel, and his resurrection is a proleptic uh, prediction of Israel's restoration. And that's where St. Paul gets to in Romans um, 11. We need more of, of that. Um, annotate I put down here is, I mean, this only applies if you have service books, but this is where, again, digital service books are really handy. Make PDFs, make those available for download in, in the parish. This is the kind of thing that, that we might do. Uh, Bishop Calistos Ware in the Lenten Triodion says, whenever we're saying things like this, we should be thinking we. We've talked about this today. Today, the Jews nailed to the cross the Lord who divided the sea. Today, they pierced him. They, 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 but it should be we. We could either rewrite this as we, but we, let's keep the poetics. And here's the kind of annotation that I do in addition to, rather than today, the Jews, today, his people. In the following stanza, remember we are also they, as all followers of Christ are grafted into the people of Israel upon whom God has bestowed his gracious love and gifts since the call of Abraham, and we ourselves have often betrayed the Savior and crucified him again. Simple, we can keep the text otherwise as is. My final comment is just, and I've said that we can't really at the parish level do much composition. Uh, Text-wise, that's kind of difficult, but we can through other aspects, both the preaching, the teaching that surround liturgy and so forth. But what else 
we could we do? In terms of iconography, here's something we have in our parish, um, an icon of the Jewish Jesus. Um, this is an icon one of my students painted for me. He's a Coptic iconographer. It came out of the course um, that we were doing. So here you have uh, Jesus wearing the prayer shawl or garment of the Jew, the, the talit with the tzitzit, the, the fringes. We know he wears them because people grasp hold of them in the gospel. Uh, he's also wearing the phylactery, the tefillin, which, of course, he doesn't want to be too broad, nor the fringes too long. But nevertheless, this was an intra-Jewish debate, an argument about how broad and how long, you know, should those be. Um, and of course, we're just not accustomed to seeing Jesus in this way. But the more we are confronted with Jesus as Jewish, Jesus as Torah observant, Jesus as the summation and encapsulation of his people Israel as their anointed Messiah, then the more we can reframe some of the us and them business into a we, um, you know, going forward. And as I said, we're just not accustomed to seeing this because, of course, we have um, this sort of iconography, which comes from this, right? It's Greek philosopher garb, and um, it depends who we really claim, you know, to, to be worshipping. I think there's scope to be doing lots of things. Anyway, that's my uh, little piece on what we do locally, and hopefully this has been a helpful uh, seminar for you all. Okay, Father Mike, it should be noted a few of these changes obscure or remove entirely the illusion to use of the biblical prophets. Well, that's not the intention. So that's where we can chat about these and discuss. It's about preserving biblical theology and poetics whilst not introducing that us versus them thing that Svetlana spoke to so, so well. But, but yeah, this is the conversation we're going to have. We're going to set up this working group. If you would like to be involved, I know some of you have indicated today you want to participate. It will be an open invitation to scholars uh, to liturgists, to people who are just generally caring about this issue. So get in touch with me. But thank you all for your participation today. We're going to wrap up now. This will be made available on the website so you can review it and we can continue this conversation. We called it beginning a conversation. That really is all it is. Thank you to all of our panelists today. Thank you, Tava, for, for your organization uh, of all this. And I wish you all a most beautiful and blessed and grace-filled Holy Week and Pascha.